give it a couple more seconds here. All right, I don't think we have any more participants in the waiting room and I've disabled that. All right, awesome. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Build a Real Estate Empire Using Very Little Cash with MAPS coach Heidi Four. I have three quick things that I want to say before I go ahead and toss it over to her. Uh, first and foremost, please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours on the MAPS YouTube channel. I'll post that link here shortly in the chat. Um, and two, uh, currently everybody is on mute. However, we do value participation. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat box and we'll get to those as well. Um, and lastly, following the meeting, if you have any questions about today's call or any other coaching programs, please email us at fasttrackkw.com. That's F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C-K at kw.com. And that's all for me. Heidi, you can go ahead and take it away. Fantastic. Thank you. So today we are talking about buying rental properties and stretching our cash out as much as possible so we can buy the most amount of properties as possible. My name is Heidi Four, and I am a KW Maps coach. I am also a realtor. I've been a realtor for 20 years, and I'm also an investor. I have 55 rental units and I bought all of them since 28, uh, 2018. So it's like, when people were saying, oh, this is a terrible time to buy, prices are so expensive. My answer was, it's all about the cash flow. If you can still find properties that have great rent income and you're getting the amount of income that you want monthly that's going to pay for um, the all the expenses of the property and still have a good amount of profit left over, buy it. Buy it in any market. So it uh, was a little bit difficult to find houses in those years. And um, that's one of the things I covered in my other webinar. So tune into that one as well on how to find properties that cash flow. Today, we're talking about how to pay for them. Before taking action on anything in this class, this is where I have my disclaimers. Talk to an attorney. Don't get yourself in trouble. Talk to an accountant. Talk to a financial planner. Talk to your realtor if you're not one. And read your mortgage terms regarding due on sale clauses if you're going to buy houses with seller financing or sell your house with seller financing, because there are rules to follow there. So today, out of all of the different ways to pay for properties, because there are like tw at least 20 different ways to pay for properties, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about eight of them. Eight ways to stretch, stretch your cash when buying investment properties. Now, all of the methods that we're going to talk about today have pros and cons. And they won't work in every situation, but they're tools that you can use as needed. And sometimes they can be combined when it solves a problem. So um, these are all different ways you can pay for properties. Doesn't mean you should in every situation. Like I said, there's pros and cons. One of the what things you can do to buy houses with very little cash if, or and sometimes none at all is buy a primary residence that you live in for a few years and then make that a rental property. That's what we have always done, my husband and I. Every time we've bought a property, we bought it with the intention that someday we're going to move out and we're going to, it's going to be a rental. And we always buy what my, uh, my sixth grader calls dumpy houses. And he says that all the time. Like, why, why do we always buy dumpy houses? Cause you make money with dumpy houses, kid. And sometimes, you know, we've bought houses, sometimes a condo. Um, you can buy a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex as your primary residence and rent out the apartments that you're not in. And uh, you, when you're buying a house as your primary residence, you get first chance at the foreclosures on many websites. The people that are buying it as a primary home get first dibs on those. So you can really get good deals. And, you know, there's some loans where you don't have to put down any money at all, 0% down. And sometimes you can get a, a conventional loan with 3% down. And then if you're a realtor, you, get, you can earn 3% commission. That's what you can charge as being the buyer's agent for yourself. So it's this is the best way to buy rental properties, in my opinion, is just to keep moving. Move every two or three years, keeping your old home as a rental. But before you move out, after you've done the improvements to the dumpy house, um, get a home equity line of credit or a, a home equity loan, a long-term one. Get those and um, use the cash from that as a down payment on another rental house. And what we've done in the past is use that home equity line of credit, like I said, to buy a rental house and then paid that down and then use it again and then paid it down and then use it again and then paid it down and used it again, which you can do with the home equity line of credit. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But I, I think that 
if you do the math, over like 15 years, you could buy six, seven houses um, as a primary resident and, and keep them as rentals and then buy another five properties from those home equity line of credits that you get on on them before you move out. So highly recommend this as, as a method if you're not doing that already. Every time, like I was saying, like we buy a house, we also make sure that we look at the homeowners association documents and make sure we are allowed to rent it out later. And the house we're in now, uh, we, we, we made sure that we could rent it out later, but also we want to be able to rent it out now as a, um, a vacation rental for one or two weeks a year to, to make some extra money. There are some big events where we live and people pay a lot of money to rent out a house during those weeks. So um, that's that's piece of advice to you. So earlier I mentioned the home equity line of credit. Usually that's a variable interest rate, which is sort of the con of it, because as you know, interest rates can go up pretty fast as we've learned. Um, but, but a pro of the home equity line of credit is as a balance is paid off, it can be reused, like how you pay off a credit card and reuse it, just don't close the line. And you only pay interest on the amount that you're using. It's really easy to get for a primary residence and sometimes you can even get up to 95 percent loan to value, but I don't recommend doing that because home values can go down and then you'd be upside down in your house, which you don't want to ever, ever, ever be trapped like that. So uh, I, I think that um, you wouldn't want to go more than 80 percent on a, a loan to value, which you can get on a, a rental property that's just harder. Most of them are going to be like 70 or 75 percent on a um, loan to value on a rental property. You can get a fixed rate equity loan on your primary residence or on a rental property. The disadvantage of this is you have to take out all of the cash up front and pay interest on it, even if you're not using all of it at, right away. But it's nice because it's a fixed rate for 10 or 20 or 30 years even, and it's paid in equal installments over a certain amount of time. And uh, But once the balance is paid back and you've paid it down, you can't reuse it. That's the con of this way. And uh, it's also easy to get on a primary residence. It's pretty easy to get on rental properties too. And you can um, go through different, your local banks sometimes will have really good deals on these, even uh, more uh, better deals than the big banks do. But if you have enough equity, either in your primary house or on a rental to do it this way, this is a great way to find it, get a down payment for your next house. Or if there's enough equity in it, you could actually buy a whole house using the home equity loan from a, another house. If you're just getting started and you have no money at all, consider getting an equity partner. Uh, an equity partner is a person that just wants to put in money and doesn't want to put in any time. So you find a partner, um, an equity partner, and you manage all the repairs, you find the tenants, and they just put in the money. The partner owns a piece of the property with you. They bring all the cash to purchase it and they pay for the repairs and the deed is in both of your names or you have an LLC together and the LLC owns the house. You can own it as tenants in common. You can split the rent with them 50-50 and then when you go to sell it, you split the profit 50-50 too. But someday um, you, you could have an agreement that someday you'll refinance the property in your name only and pay back the equity partner plus half of the increased value and then you could solely own the house that way. So that's one way to do it with no money. Another way would be to get a debt partner. This is also known as private lending, getting a private lender. This is where you ask someone to borrow the money to buy the property and you offer to pay them back in fixed payments over an agreed period of time. You both can negotiate a win-win on terms that seem fair to both of you. They don't own the house. You don't have to um, worry about asking them about uh, their opinion on everything because they're they're they don't own it with you. They're just in it for the, uh, the interest that they're getting on their money. You could refinance it with a traditional mortgage later. And you remember that you can have up to 10 traditional fixed rate 30 year mortgages in your personal name. So that's a great way to buy someone out after like you've, you've gotten some more equity in the property and you've got, um, you've gotten some good financing in place. So after the debt is paid, you don't owe them anything else. And when you go to sell the property, you don't split the proceeds with them. It's all yours. This is good for a uh, property that you want to hold long-term. And a lot of people don't know this, but someone's self-directed IRA can lend you money. 
So somebody might say, well, I would lend you the money, but all my money is tied up in, in my retirement accounts. Well, they can actually put that that money that's in their retirement accounts into a self-directed IRA. And in a self-directed IRA, they can lend you money. Um, ask your accountant about that, if that's a good idea. One of the ways that I purchased a house was putting money that I had in a, like a I think it was like a Scott trade or an E-Trade Roth IRA. I put it into a self-directed IRA and bought a house with it. There's a lot of rules around that, which we can talk about in another session. Uh, another way to pay for a house is through a hard money lender. This is a little bit different than the private money lender. A hard money lender usually is a company and they mostly work with flippers and they have set terms about their loans, usually published on their website or on a flyer. Um, sometimes they'll offer 100% financing. It just depends on the deal. They, they can do a fast closing, sometimes like within a week or 10 days. It's a very easy underwriting process, but here's the con to this kind is uh, it's a really high interest rate. It's usually like 12% um, is what hard money lenders charge, which if you're getting a really good deal uh, and you're going to refinance it quickly, uh, might be the way to go, especially if you need the money fast. Usually they want their money paid back in a year. Sometimes they'll go out three years, but most of them that I've talked to, they want to be paid back in 12 months. So you either need to sell it or refinance it within that year. And uh, if the deal doesn't look like a good enough deal, well, they, they won't do it. Like it has to be a really good gamble for them. Um, and you might need to borrow the down payment from someone because they're not usually going to do 100% financing, but you could borrow the payment from someone else, down payment for someone else, and then use a hard money lender for the rest. Another option for you, get what, did, get what did there, is a lease option. A master lease option gives you the right to sublet the property. So you could actually buy a house by renting it first. If you've got some credit issues you're working through, this would be a good um, method, possibly. You could ask the landlord or the home seller, if, like if someone's selling their house, if they would rent the house to you and allow you to sublet it as a short-term rental or a traditional rent agreement, a long-term rental. If you do it as a short-term rental, sometimes people call this Airbnb rental arbitrage. That's like the fancy name for it, where you're renting a house or a condo for a set amount every month, and then you can re-rent it to someone else at a higher amount, keep the difference, and work on your credit like uh, for the, that first year that you're renting it um, or go talk to um, debt partners that might give you the loan on it. And you're gonna have a, a separate agreement called an option agreement that would allow you the option to purchase it at the end of your rental agreement, the end of your lease. And it would set out the terms of the purchase price and the, the terms of the purchase. Uh, so you would have uh, also a purchase agreement. So there'd be three agreements if you go this method. The, the rental agreement, the lease, the option agreement, and the purchase agreement. Every state is going to handle this different. So check it out, the laws in your state for rent uh, with the option to purchase. Usually they want the seller slash landlord would want a security deposit and option money. Option money could be 1%, 2%, 3%, but it's usually, um, it's not that much. It's affordable. Another way would be seller financing. This is done much easier if there's not a mortgage on the house. Um, if the seller has an existing mortgage on the house, your agreement to purchase the house from them through seller financing is called a wrap mortgage. Sometimes people call it a subject to purchase because it's subject to another mortgage. You can pay the seller's current mortgage plus a little extra to the seller every month. And you, would, uh, you could then rent the house to a tenant and keep the difference. So every month the seller's getting paid, their mortgage is getting paid, the rent, the renter is paying rent to you, you're keeping the difference. That would be a way to buy a rental house using seller financing. This is good to use if the seller just wants to unload a problem house, like the house is just one thing after another, it's a hassle for them, or they're getting older and they don't have the energy to landlord anymore, but they like the idea of monthly payments. So this is where you could say, um, I, I see you have a house on the market and that it's rented out. I'd be happy to pay you what you're asking over the course of 200 months. I just can't pay it all up front. 
So don't bring up the interest rate. It's, it complicates things. Just tell them how long it would take you to pay them what they're asking. And for some people, they're like, you know what? That actually sounds good. I like that. That takes away my problem and I'm still getting something monthly because they bought the house because they wanted monthly payments from the house. So this is a way for them to get it and you get a rental house and then you can refinance it over time once you find a, a, a good loan program that would work well for you. So those are the, the eight ways to buy houses with little, very, very little cash up front. I wanna talk now about a popular, a popular method of purchasing homes. It's called the Burr method. And it, it stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Now let's go through these options. So you have to buy a house first using cash. Then you rehab it, repair it, and remodel it, whatever you wanna call it. Find a renter, rent, get it rented out, get a lease on it, and then go to a local bank and refinance it using a cash out refinance loan. I use the word local lender again because I've always found better deals going somewhere local. Now, this my favorite bank, it's a local bank I found. I had to call 12 banks first to find the one that would give it give me the loan on the terms that I wanted. I said, I want the um, the loans to be amortized over like 25 or 30 years. I, I want a fixed rate. I want um, to be able to put it in the name of an LLC. And I want to, um, to get the, the cash out loan, the cash, I'm sorry. I want to get the loan based on the appraised value, not the purchase value. That's the key because a lot of banks wouldn't do it that way. So you might have to call 12 banks, but you'll find one that will do it with those terms. So once the bank gives you a loan based on the appraised value, because it's been approved at that point, then you take that cash that you get at the closing and you just go repeat the process all over again, recycle that money. So the first house pays for the second, the second house pays for the third, the third house pays for the fourth, and so on and so on and so on. It, you could actually get three houses a year doing it that way. Like if, if you have the time to dedicate to this, first of all, doing a cash out refinance is probably another five hours a week of work. Cause you know, when you do a cash out, when you do any kind of loan, there's paperwork, 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 paperwork that the bank wants. So just know that that's the kind of the con to this method is you're spending a lot of time turning in documents to banks. But the benefit is you can just keep recycling the same money over and over and over again. Cause you could probably only takes you three or four months to get a house fixed up and rented and refinanced and just so you just keep rolling that money. So you're like, okay, that sounds great, Heidi, but where the heck am I gonna get the money for, for the first house? How am I gonna buy a house with cash? Well, this is where discipline comes in, financial discipline. You have to have enough cash to knock over that first domino, which then does the second, third, fourth, fifth. You, so here's some, some tips. If you're not already doing it, save 20% of every paycheck until there's enough. Learn to live on less than possible. Sell a car sell a business, move funds over from a self -direct, into a self-directed IRA, get a side hustle and all the money from the side hustle funds your savings account for an investment property. It may take a while, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And, and when you're looking for houses that would be a good burr, you're gonna to wanna to look for houses that are, that you can buy for 70% of the after repair value in order for this to work so that you can recycle the money. Otherwise, it's not a perfect BRRRR. So if a house, let's just use $100,000. If a house would be worth $100,000 after it's repaired, you're gonna to wanna to buy it for 70 in as is condition. And then once you can put $10,000 into repairing it, you go and you get an appraisal for 100, you get a cash out refinance loan for 80%. So you have your $80,000, which pays you back for what you bought the house for and covers the repairs. Makes sense, right? This is a really great way to, to buy homes. So there's a few, I'm not gonna go into each of these, but there are other ways to be a real estate investor. Some people, 
put money into apartment building syndications. They put together a deal. And by putting together the deal for like a large apartment building that they bring all the, the investors together. And by doing that, they earn like 20% of the, of the property. And they also earn some fees for putting it together. You can also just buy into somebody else's syndication as a passive investor. You could do crowdfunding where you pool your money with other investors. You could use real estate investment trusts. Um, which is great because uh, you, in those situations, you don't have to go find the property. Someone else finds the property uh, and you don't have to find other investors because someone else is doing that too. You're just a passive investor. There's something called Delaware Statutory Trust, which is that same concept. It's totally passive income. It's good if you are in a 1031 exchange situation, meaning you have some, you're sold a property a rental property and you're about to pay capital gains on it, if you don't find another replacement property, um, you can actually find a Delaware statutory trust that qualifies for a 1031 exchange. In a similar situation, if you owe capital, if you're going to owe capital gains taxes, one thing you can do is buy into an opportunity zone fund. It can defer those capital gains down the road. So those are some other ways to be a real estate investor without coming up with enough cash to buy a whole house all on your own. So where does this fit into the whole investing picture? Well, the first thing you're going to do if you're just getting started is you need a vision of what your financial freedom life looks like and how much your life costs so that you know how many houses you're going to need to buy to pay for your life. You're going to need to learn to calculate how much cash flow, how much profit is going to come in on a house so that you'll know a good deal when you see one. You'll want to choose what type of real estate is right for you and do a deeper dive of what we talked about today, which is how to pay for it. And then you go out and find the rental properties to buy that meet your criteria. Uh, then what you'll want to know is how to work best with tenants. What are the checklists that you need to go through for every house when you get a new tenant and when a tenant moves out? How should you maintain your properties? Who maintains the properties? How do you track your key performance indicators on each property? And then once you're like, okay, all my processes are in place, I've bought all the houses, they're all rented out, the tenants are paying, they're taking care of the homes, I have financial freedom. Then we need to protect it. Make sure you've got the right insurance in place so that, that your assets are protected through the proper trusts and LLCs. And that um, at that point, you can make sure that you're, you've got a great property manager and that after paying the property manager, you're still going to have enough money coming to you passively to pay for your life. And that is when you have true financial freedom. And all of those steps that are on the screen there are talked about in my full length course. Um, my full length course is eight hour sessions. It's what we talked about today, plus a lot more. And info on it is on fundyourbiglife.com. It's, uh, there's also a Facebook group for the course where I post deals that I find and I post helpful information that I find um, as an investor. And there's this really amazing spreadsheet that I made for the course that really helps you make, helps you make good financial decisions. Some of the people that took the course are like, just the spreadsheet and the checklist from the workbook were worth the whole price of the course. And you get to ask me questions uh, during the course of uh, the deal that you find and we can analyze it. Uh, you can watch it with a partner, with your spouse, with your team, and uh, it's one hour a week for eight weeks. Uh, I call it Wealth Building Wednesday. My team watches it on Wednesdays. And yeah, you can scan that QR code or go to fundyourbiglife.com. And we also have a coupon code. If you want to save $159 on the course, you can use the coupon code WEALTH20. And I appreciate you coming here today. I'm going to take uh, five minutes for questions now. And I hope that you will come to future webinars that we have here. And I hope that you will let people know about my course, Fund Your Big Life with Rental Properties. Okay, I'm going to go check the chat. If you have any questions, put them in there. Okay, how to, um, the other class I have on how to find properties. Yeah, my upcoming classes, there's links to them on my website, advicefromheidi.com. Advicefromheidi.com. 
How much is the total price? Seven ninety eight. The yes, the sessions will be recorded and you can rewatch later. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what people um, find is like they're watching the course and then they're like, oh, I need to show my spouse this. And then they go back and rewatch that particular part of the course with their spouse. What is average tenancy per tenant? Tell me what you mean by that, Kate. Do you have a target price point of homes that you purchase or just the greatest ROI? Oh, yes, sorry, other QR code. Let's go here. There we go. There's the QR code that works. Uh, target price point. I go for um, a few things. One, I want to look at cash on cash return. And two, I want to look at cash flow per month. I have a target of $300 per unit per month. I like to buy affordable houses in lower middle class to low income neighborhoods. Um, I like that because there's not as much of a risk if somebody doesn't pay one month. It's not as big of a hurt as if I had a bunch of luxury homes that I was renting out and if let's I, I, uh, and then they go vacant for a month or two or if someone's not paying. So my target price point is under $100,000. In my area it is possible. What is the term that a tenant rents uh, from Kate? Uh, one year, 12 months. And then I have my leases adjust to month to month after that with a 5% rent increase after the first year. Well, I hope you'll come to the next one. Again, the link is on advicefromheidi.com. And thanks for being here today. See you soon. Thank you. You sign up for the first day of the week? I'm not going to be here. Oh, okay.